May I speak in the name of the living, loving God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Nearly ten years ago, I sat with my husband with a group of Christian pilgrims in Hebron and shared a meal of upside-down rice and chicken. Hebron, named after Abraham, the father of faith. Hebron, which means God's friend in Arabic. As we ate, we listened to a young Israeli an ex-paratrooper who had served three years in the Israeli army. He had started a group called Breaking the Silence. He wanted to break the silence about what was really going on in Hebron, the way a formerly vibrant market town was now a ghost town, a place of fear, where young children faced insults and worse from ideological Israeli settlers as they walked to school, where snipers deliberately shot holes in the water tanks of the indigenous Palestinian population, the water tanks being their only mean of, of getting water, where he as a soldier was told that his job was to instill fear into the beleaguered community that lived there. Well, we'd seen for ourselves the ghost town and the poverty and the painful reality of a town ruled by fear and division. But it was very inspiring to hear this young man breaking the silence, his attempt to sow seeds of understanding in such a divisive place. But nearly 10 years on, I asked myself, has anything changed, I wonder, there? How are we doing on breaking down the dividing walls, the hostility between people? How are we doing on creating one new humanity in place of division, on proclaiming peace to those who are far off and peace to those who are near? As the writer of the letter to the Ephesians advocates, and whose words, I have to admit, stirred me up this week. Well, my first thought was, well, not very well. I don't think we're doing very well. Not well at all. Of course, the Israeli-Palestinian situation is just one extreme example of the divisions between peoples. But we don't have to look far in our own country to find nasty sources of division. So many different ways in which we treat those not like us as the other. Think of the rhetoric around asylum seekers invading, taking over. Let's make it as difficult as possible for people fleeing appalling situations to find refuge in a land where actually all of us probably arrived, our descendants probably did actually arrive also in small boats seeking a place to live. I think of my son, aged 11, being told that he couldn't be part of the band because he was brown. I think of my sister-in-law seeking to buy a house in a nice area of Glasgow, told by estate agents always that it was not available, although for white inquirers from her office it mysteriously always was of her having to take a case all the way up to the Court of Appeal just to have the opportunity to buy a home in a nice part of Glasgow for her family. I think of the abuse of the three young footballers last week simply because they too were brown. And the church, of course, is not immune. Think of the Windrush generation refused a place in our churches and having to set up their own churches to be members of the household of God. I could go on and on. No doubt you too will have other illustrations of division in family, at work, in society at large. And of course it's hard to stand up and break the silence. 
about all this unpleasantness. It can take courage to say what needs to be said, not just to brush it aside. And it's clear, of course, from the very contents of the letter to the Ephesians that this problem was there right at the start of the young church attempting to follow Christ. The particular division the writer is naming is that between Jews and Gentiles. But I think it's possible to apply all he says to any sources of division between peoples. The writer reminds them that they used to walk without faith, without hope, without God. But now he says, in Christ, you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For me, that me, for me, that means that the death of Christ on the cross is not just for a select group, but for everyone. That Christ's act of dying on the cross is the ultimate act of unconditional love. Unconditional, unconditional love, which means that everyone, Jew and Gentile, male and female, brown and white, Palestinian and Israeli, Protestant and Catholic, heterosexual and homosexual, all dividing walls are broken down as Christ suffered, died, and rose again, and appeared to his disciples not with words of enmity, but with peace be with you. And of course, this is all at one with Jesus' life before his death. Think back about all our recent readings from Mark's Gospel, and we see Jesus, a young man, always ready to break the silence, to greet those outcasts from his society, the bleeding woman, the leper, the hated tax collector, the physically and mentally unwell. All are shown compassion and healing and brought back into their own community by Jesus. So the writer to the Ephesian reminds us all that we're no longer strangers and aliens, but all members of one household. A household that has at its cornerstone the one who shows us the way of peace, of unconditional love, of how to know God. And I was thinking, where can I find a ray of hope? a light, a vibrant, living image of this household of God today. And the image that came into my mind, surprisingly, was the English football team. <laughs> and in particular, those three young, black, Pentecostal Christians, Marcus Rashford, Jaden Sancho, and Bakaya Saka. All Christians, all quick when asked to thank God for their gifts, but not afraid to break the silence about the abuse they receive. Part of a diverse team working together and supporting each other, and whose example has become an inspiration to many. I also see a little tentative light flickering in the Living in Love and Faith initiative of the Church of England a thoughtful, deeply pastoral program designed to help us learn how to work well with those we disagree with, to break the silence about our sexuality and learn to look at each other with compassion and understanding, to live together in love and faith. Because as the writer to the Ephesians reminds us, we are called be one enormous household with Christ at its cornerstone, built into a dwelling place for God. Imagine it, each one of us here, a unique dwelling place for God, the God of hope, the God of compassion, the God of unconditional, amazing love. Amen.